Good. Okay. I'm being recorded now. And uh, what should I do? Uh, this and this. And I'm ready to go. Okay. Uh, sorry for that. Uh, so, uh, mathematics and theoretical computing seminar. Uh, I'm going to to talk about uh, machine learning on graphs, and it's a continuation of the previous seminar that Matei had. On uh, uh, we prepare. Uh, I mean, Matei and Andre mostly prepared uh, two huge graphs of two libraries in Agda. And the nodes on, on uh, in this graph, now Matei, uh, be careful that I don't say something silly uh, or stupid. Uh, so the, the nodes in this graph are definitions, right, of uh, in Agda. Uh, and uh, the purpose why we uh, build these two graphs uh, is that we want to employ machine learning. So we are able to recommend to somebody who writes a new definition in Agda maybe a definition or or, or a theor or, or proving a theorem uh, to be able to recommend him what kind of lemmas or other definitions are needed in his particular context okay so uh and of course because of that we would like to be able to uh learn on graphs and to to employ machine learning on graphs okay uh so now uh all the machine learning is in the title of this uh, seminar. I would like uh, actually to uh, send out. <clears throat> Hi. Hi. Uh, you know, I'm recording on my computer. So, Excellent. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry, I'm late. Uh, don't worry. Did anybody uh, introduce you? Well, I introduced myself. Excellent. So. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, uh, although the title of this, uh, of, the, of this seminar is machine learning, I'm going to talk about machine, uh, uh, machine, okay, yeah, misspelling, sorry, uh, machine learning uh, uh, only, I mean, in, uh, in traditional sense of machine learning, I'm not only going to talk about it in, in, in a single slide at the beginning. And then I'm going to uh, actually say, well, uh, this is what, uh, what is done in machine learning. And then let's see how we cope with uh, non-standard settings. So the standard setting in machine learning is that uh, the training data are ex uh, is uh, um, actually a set of training examples, which are tuples. Okay? So uh, the tuples here are represented. So each uh, example is x, y. Uh, and we have the values of input variables x, uh, and that uh, is actually a member of a Cartesian product of some uh, of domains of the input variables, dx1 to dxp. And we usually have a single tar target variable, all do. Uh, in general, we can have also many target variables, as we will see during the talk. So uh, y is a single uh, variable. And many machine learning algorithms, especially neural networks, would assume that the, all the input variables are actually numeric. So what is the purpose of machine learning? The purpose of machine learning is to learn a mapping uh, from um, uh, a given set of examples x, y, to learn a mapping which, uh, given the values of the input variables, is able to uh, calculate the uh, value of the target value, y. Okay, so uh, actually the uh, what is being learned is a model, uh, so-called a predictive model, which given the values of uh, uh, the input variables that, uh, in dx, uh, calculates a value from dy. Okay, so the training set is the, from the Cartesian product of the X and dy. So the algorithm itself, the machine learn, uh, learning algorithm in, in general, given the data set de, from the uh, dx uh, Cartesian de, uh, dy, actually uh, returns a model which uh, uh, maps from dx to dy. Many machine learning algorithms assume that the training examples are independent and uh, um, and identically uh, distributed. 
You mean so, they assume this under this assumption there are some guarantees on how well they work or what? Oh yeah, yeah. And uh, you can, actually, you can probably run the algorithm on unreasonable data and it'll give you something unreasonable. Yes, yeah. uh, of course. And yeah. you, I mean, mostly we'll see today many unreasonable settings, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, so, uh, but, uh, and of course in graphs, uh, if you have the vertices as, uh, as examples, I mean, this is obviously not really true. I mean, it, independence is maybe mm -hmm. a, a bit shaky. So that is why I'm, I'm starting with that. So when we go to machine learning on graphs, so uh, the main uh, the main message on the, of the first slide is that the training examples are topless. Okay, so that is a, a kind of of, of uh, thing to remember. Now, when we want to do machine learning on graphs, of course, the training objects originate in graphs, and uh, so graphs has vertices and edges, and uh, training objects can be vertices, edges, or graphs. Okay, so we can learn on vertices, uh, and in that case, the training objects are elements of B. We can learn on edges, training objects are elements of P, e. or in general, we can learn on graphs. So the training objects themselves are graphs, and we would like for example, to classify graphs into into different groups, okay, based on on some properties of these groups, okay. So, <clears throat> uh, and uh, maybe I should I should show some example of why this makes sense. So, uh, why we would like to, uh, exa for example, learn on uh, on vertices, uh, because we want to perform sometimes node classification. What would be a node uh, node classification task? Node classification task means that we have graph with uh, partially labeled uh, uh, labeled nodes, okay, or vertices. So imagine that uh, on Facebook we we know the political affiliation of some of the, or on Twitter social network we know the political affiliations of some of the members of the social network, and we would like to infer the political affiliations or preferences of the others. Okay, this is like widely used recently. And of course, here you, you would like to have a model on a uh, train on the known vertices of, of the vertices with known affiliations. You would like to train a model. And this model will be uh, will be able then to predict the color, if you want, of the of the particular node. Okay, so this is interesting, not for Agda, maybe. What is interesting uh, for Agda and the graphs we built on Agda is the uh, task of link prediction. And these now, the training objects here are uh, not the vertices, but the edges in the graph. Okay, so uh, here you uh, somehow analyze the graph through the time, some, uh, some dynamic graph which changes through the time. And you assume that at certain and in the training period, uh, in the train in the period when you train your graph, you only observe a subset of edges on the graph. Okay, you maybe uh, observe the edges which exist at certain time point, and that means in Agda that you observe the connections between definitions in the current version of the library, and then you would like to infer a model which is able to predict the link which will appear in the next version of the library when somebody starts to build a new uh, a new uh, proof then you would say well this new proof would uh, actually i mean you would predict the links with existing lemmas and definitions in the uh, in the um, at the library and the, and thus you will be able to uh, recommend and to help uh, the the user to um, to actually write the code. Okay, so in general, I mean, this is a very general task. Again, if we go to social networks, this is what happens when LinkedIn recommends you to connect to somebody. Okay, they run in a background all these uh, social networks. They run these link prediction algorithms, and they try to predict who will be your next friend there. Okay. And now uh, there are uh, basically two approaches of how you start to learn on graphs, okay? So the first approach is to establish a mapping between, so 
what is the problem and why we need now additional approach which goes beyond the usual uh, machine learning setting. Again, let me remind you that if you want to do traditional machine learning, you would like your training objects to be tuples, okay? And with fixed dimension. And uh, in order to do so, one way to go is to establish such a mapping, okay? And say, well, okay, I have some uh, training objects in a set O, and I will establish a mapping uh, E from O to uh, Euclidean space of fixed dimension P, okay? And I can establish that mapping <clears throat> manually. I don't know, I invent some features, okay? I will show you an example. And uh, of course, then you use this mapping E to transform your training objects into tuples and you're done. Then you can use arbitrary machine learning algorithm on the tuples and you can do uh, whatever machine learning magic you want, okay? And this is the topic of this seminar, actually. We will see that, okay, uh, that, uh, I mean, uh, you can, you can uh, establish this ma mapping manually, but since we are in machine learning, we would like to do we would like to learn the mapping, okay? And that's the, I believe I say, that that would be the main topic, okay? So uh, next week, on the next seminar, we will see alternative approach. We will say, well, no, I don't want to establish now additional mapping, but I would like to, tra to train my model directly on the graph. But to in, order, in able to do so, I have to go. Uh, I have to go to some more general approach, which would allow me to learn uh, in structured representation. Typically, I would go to learning in logic, and that would be the topic of the next seminar, where I am not. Uh, I mean, those approaches are capable of learning not from tuples only, but also from structured training objects. Okay, but that that's for next week. Now, uh, what I'm going to do today is uh, first I'm going to talk about simple mappings, okay? Uh, and the, uh, when I say simple mappings here, uh, I'm uh, so these are the mappings from the training objects to uh, to the um, uh, to tuples, and I'm going to first to establish simple mappings of where I don't need machine learning to establish them, okay? I can do that, you know, I, I do them manually or semi-automatically. And then, uh, uh, I'm, but in any case, I'm doing them without machine learning. And then in the last part of the seminar, I'm going to show how we learn these mappings from training objects to tuples. And those mappings are called then embeddings somehow. So learning embeddings or learning representations is the topic which I'm going to consider the last, okay? Uh, so, uh, Matei already showed uh, last week that the Agda graphs he produced are not void of uh, properties of the vertices, okay? So, he already calculated a lot of properties of the vertices, uh, and they're already included in the Neo4j database he showed previous week, okay? And these are just numeric properties calcu uh, calculated on individual vertices like degree, closeness, betweenness, centrality, page rank. I don't even remember the whole list. Uh, maybe, Matei, if something crucial is missing here, you can just, yeah. But anyway, you can imagine that actually for, your, for each uh, uh, vertex in the graph, we have a, uh, some numeric properties which are obviously based on how the node is being connected to the other nodes of the graph. Okay, and we can already consider these as a tuple representation of a node, okay, and do machine learning on this. Okay, and, but this machine learning model can only grasp these properties and say, well, nodes of high degree have this on the, uh, or that property, or maybe recommend to the user. Yeah, typically, uh, he would have a bias to recommend to the user uh, the nodes with high degree because they are obviously used. Uh, many, many times in the library, okay? And uh, page rank, for example, would uh, calculate the popularity of the node somehow, the uh, connectedness of the node, and then page rank would be an obvious uh, property to use and say, well, the, if, if a lemma is used many, many times in the graph, probably you need it as well, okay? Now, that shouldn't be too good, but it 
it's a way to start. Now, uh, of course, uh, this is uh, uh, then uh, these properties are limited because they only take into account the structure of the graph. And then each vertex of uh, the vertex of the of the Agda graph have uh, much more information in each in each node of the Agda graph. We can ask ourselves what is the source code which is included in the definition. Because every node corresponds to a definition, we have a source code. We have a text affiliated with the node. So can we use a text? Now, the text is uh, a sequence, OK? And as I said, we need fixed length tuples. So in principle, machine learning algorithms cannot take text as, an, uh, as a training object unless they do tra some transformation. Now, the basic transformations, which is being used in machine learning for transforming a text to a tuple is the bag of words model. And uh, uh, despite the fact that it is uh, referred to as a bag of words, it's a uh, uh, model, it was invented for images first. Okay, so uh, if you want to do uh, any kind of uh, machine learning or images, you are again in trouble because the image can uh, the images can come in different sizes, different number of pixels, and they're very hard to uh, to uh, describe as tuples to represent as tuples. Okay, so the traditional approach would be to take an image and to take a set of uh, basic terms. Okay, and these basic terms are just small, you know, three times three or five times five or ten times ten pixels images. And then you ask yourself, what is the frequency of a certain pattern uh, in the image? Okay, <coughs> and then you establish this mapping by saying, okay, I will represent this image and say, well, uh, this pattern is uh, presented, uh, is very frequent, these three patterns are very frequent, and the rest are not that frequent. And every image has then a tuple representation. And uh, these, uh, the, the, the variables uh, uh, which are uh, describing, representing the image are actually numeric variables corresponding to these frequencies. OK? So that's. This is made up data, right? These are not real examples. Mm, this is made up. I haven't run in, uh, through uh, machine learning algorithms. No, I mean, just because I don't see a black spot in the second example, but it's got a non-zero distribution. Oh, yeah, but yeah, sure, they're yeah. made up. We can imagine what happens. <laughs> yeah, uh, maybe there is a hidden one which we cannot see, but no, well, you're right. Though. <laughs> okay, but the formal definition, this is uh, known as a bag of words model, and uh, the formal definition, uh, it says that it consists of three components, okay? Uh, the first uh, very important component, obviously, is a dictionary of terms, also words, uh, T, uh, and then you have a set of training objects, obviously, O, uh, which is, but they're not represented as tuples, obviously. And then you have also a frequency function. And of course, since we are living in, the, in, uh, in computer science, we assume that this is computable, okay? And this, is, this can be implemented efficiently. So this function should take a, a term and take an object and calculates a, a natural number, which corresponds to the number of occurrences of a term T in an object O, okay? And of course, uh, once we have that, we actually uh, transform our training objects into T input variables, uh, size of T input variables. So for each term, we are going to uh, assign, uh, to each term, we are going to assign an input variable XT, and then we will uh, just uh, replace the training object with the frequencies of T in O, okay, a, a certain a training object O, okay. So uh, very, uh, very, very simple uh, definition, okay? And very simple mapping. And this is what was done uh, in, uh, with machine learning till 2010, okay? Whenever you had text you, or, or a sequence in general, you would uh, cope with this, okay? Uh, so this is going to... Ah, it depends on the terms. So the question I was going to ask the question: Will this obliterate uh, any sort of relative positions of terms, like order in the sequence? 
Well, actually, what is the limitation of 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 of, of bag of words is uh, it's uh, it, uh, the model is oblivious to the sequence actually to the ordering in the sequence. Right. Okay. Unless That's you okay. started doing strange things and your terms are really n tuples of words, and then you can see yeah, a little yeah. bit of it. And... Yeah, you can use n grams instead of uh, individual words. So in your term dictionary, you add also yeah, two two words. Then you are really it. increasing the dimension. And that probably is not that has its own problems, right? Yeah, of course. Curse of dimensionality is known. As, uh, yeah. I mean, that's the first lecture in machine learning, but it, I didn't have time to go. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, yeah. Uh, so the components here, uh, if we uh, for for example, it is used for text documents, and I said they, those are sequences, but actually, bag of words model do not consider them as sequences, but just as you know just some words, okay, and you calculate frequencies. So uh, in, in this particular setting, uh, O consists of text documents, dictionary E, T contains words of word sequences, and also words or, or word sequences, as I said, and grams, uh, which Andre just oh, asked. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. yeah, and then uh, if you have the ACTA graph, actually what you have uh, as uh, as uh, at hand as a training object each node has a source code of acta definitions corresponding to the vertices. so yeah you can do bag of words in the in our particular context and actually what well, uh, that is what uh, uh, Matei already showed uh, last week okay uh, so uh, he was also showing that uh, maybe uh, calculating the term frequency only is not the smartest thing to do, because uh, the problem is that it is known also from uh, from processing text that uh, the terms with high frequency are usually uninformative and void of semantics. Imagine uh, the word n or the word d. In, in in English, right? Those are very frequent terms, but they're void of information because they're present everywhere. Okay, so you wouldn't like to have that, and that is uh, so. The mapping itself is a bit more complicated than just calculating the frequency. You also have to calculate the frequency of a given term among the whole set of documents in O. And if you realize that the, a certain term is present in all the documents. That's probably not uh, something to be given a high reward on the, or the high value of the feature. So that is why we have term frequency and inverse document frequency. So we'll, you, we would like to have terms which are highly frequent in a certain document, but they're not frequent when we observe their frequency among all the documents. Okay, so this is the the transformation that is being done. Okay, and and you've already heard a bit of this uh, during the previous seminar. Okay, uh, and uh, okay, so what's wrong now with bag of words? Why cannot we dismiss this seminar now and say, okay, we have all the tools in our hands and we can proceed and go and analyze our graph? Well, uh, so the the bag of words model uh, um, is semantic. Uh, I mean, uh, is ignorant to semantics. Okay. So uh, he cannot realize that some of the terms in the dictionary might be very similar, okay? So you can have two terms, which means the same thing. And you wouldn't even realize because they're just separate variables, right? They're separate words and they're going to, in your representation of the training objects, these two words will be just equal, okay? Uh, but they're, they're going to be separate, uh, uh, separate uh, variables. Okay, and the other thing which I already explained is that the, uh, that the sequence, uh, the sequence of words is being ignored. That's even worse. Okay, so you don't you're not even aware with this mapping whether uh, what was the sequence of words originally, and this was wasn't taken into account when calculating the mapping. Okay. Uh, so the solution is uh, what uh, was invented in the from 2010 on in machine learning was uh, the focus on learning representations. So it wasn't, uh, I mean, machine learning now uh, somehow uh, became, uh, um, I mean, uh, started to live this double life, okay? So one is the traditional methods which work on tuples and they continue to develop. 
But then the other, uh, the other, uh, um, I would say, uh, strain of research in machine learning went into into the direction of learning representations. So if you have complex objects, how to represent them in uh, in terms? And maybe learning representation sounds very very general. I mean, it's learning mappings uh, from uh, train from from any kind of structured uh, training objects to tuples. Okay, mostly. No, all of that is, uh, I mean, yeah, but mostly it's that. And of course, the constraint here, now, the estab obviously establishing a mapping between training objects in the Euclidean space is not such a problem because I already showed you two tricks to do that. And of course, if you if you provide a, an opportunity to, for machine learning to learn this, uh, this uh, uh, so-called embedding, uh, then uh, you should put some constraint. Okay, on what you would like to achieve, because otherwise any mapping would do, right? And uh, what's there to learn? And of course, the constraint is that similar vectors correspond to similar training objects. Okay, a very general constraint. Now, of course, I mean, uh, mm -hmm. all of you would ask, what is similar? Okay, we know what are similar vectors in, in Euclidean space. Okay, because we have uh, a clear metric of distance, and when we know what are the similar uh, vectors, but we may be not, we are not maybe sure what are similar training objects. Okay, so of course, every method which I'm going to show now to the, uh, during this seminar would assume some kind of similarity between training objects. Sometimes, sometimes this, assumpt uh, this assumption is explicit, and sometimes it is implicit in the method, but I'm going to, uh, to talk about that. Now, the first idea, uh, which appeared in about 2013, was uh, actually a very old idea from the 60s, uh, and it's called a distributional conjecture in linguistics, okay? So uh, I'm not really, uh, I mean, I'm not, into linguistics, obviously, but I know the general idea of the distributional conjecture. It says that the words with a similar meaning are being used in a similar context or even in the same context, okay? So that means if you write a sentence, I mean, usually the uh, you can change a single word with the synonym in that particular context. And if you use that, uh, I mean, synonyms are, are being used in, in, in similar sentences, right? And then, so what would be nice to have as training examples for learning the mapping would be the context of a certain word. Okay, so if you train your uh, mapping from the context, you might be able to 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 um, satisfy this constraint that the similar vectors will represent similar objects. Okay, uh, and you can see so, so words like educational, education, etc., should be uh, somehow similar. I will show you further examples later on, and. Uh, Okay, so the machine learning interpretation of the idea is to um, transform context into training example. So a training example. So what is a context of a word? A context of a word is uh, just uh, given the, the document as a sequence of words. So imagine that you have a Wikipedia entry there with the uh, L words, okay? The context of size K of a word uh, WI in this sequence is just key words uh, before the particular observed word I would like to um, observe and the key words which are following in the sequence of words, okay? So you can see uh, what's the context. And once I decide on the context, I can, uh, and that this is the context, I can transform my original sequence of L words into these kind of training examples, okay? Just very simple sliding window, okay? Nothing really special. And then now the question is, how am I going to learn my uh, my mapping from this, okay? And uh, okay, uh, now uh, since I have this um, this, uh, <clears throat> I define these variables input variables. Uh, I can decide, obviously, if there is a special variable here, this is the, the central word, the word I observe itself, okay? So I will try to, I mean, the, the, what, what obviously I can do, I can give a special role 
to this particular variable x0 and treat uh, the rest uh, uh, in a different way. And if I put that into, uh, into uh, machine learning context, I should decide what are the input variables and what are the target variables, okay? So <clears throat> uh, the input, uh, I can decide that I want to predict the word from, it co uh, from its context, okay? That would be one machine, traditional machine learning thing that I would like to do. So I'm trying now to predict the word given it, its context. And then in that particular case, I will need 2K input variables and a single target variable of x0. And this is called a so-called continuous back of words model. And that was uh, actually, uh, that was one of the alternatives, the, the, real, uh, the real method of uh, word to back relies on a different model. The mod, uh, this model is much more ill-posed, I would say even, because it tries to do something really crazy. Uh, it tries to predict, given a word, it tries to predict the context of the word. Uh, now, can anybody imagine why would Google be very interested in this kind of model, where you have a word and we would like to predict the context of that particular word? Uh, we're trying to predict. So, just a question. A question here: When we pre when we predict these things, so do we typically predict? a distribution yes. or a single yes. thing with some confidence and what do we usually do? Uh, you actually predict a uh, uh, probability distribution over all the possible words. Over all the possible, well in this case all the possible contexts and you're trying yes. to figure out which ones are the yes. ones that are very probable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that is why I'm, called, I'm, I'm saying that this is almost zero post, but yeah. But somehow it works if you have many, 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 many learning examples. I mean, a lot of learning examples. But uh, yeah, my question was, can Why would anybody want, what's the use for this? Yeah. For a preparation? So if, if the goal knows that I would... It's so much more Google, obvious like, use. You just search in Google, it tells you how to continue. Yeah, yeah. of course. <laughs> I mean, that is why Google wanted this model. It yeah. wasn't about embedding at first place. Uh, but it was about predicting what are you going to type, okay? So that is that is why uh, this uh, particular uh, piece of work originates at Google, okay? Because they were solving some other practical problem, and they said, well, maybe this is an embedding as well. So but, but yeah, they would be predicting the future context, right? Yeah, of course, and this is um, a bit more ambitious because yeah. this uh, predicts the future and the previous context. But, no, but yeah. I mean, predicting <laughs> what the user just typed before he came to Google could be oh. very valuable and embarrassing for the user. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but we have chat GPT now for that, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, chat GPT can be even better. You 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 discuss something and then it tells you what you were thinking half an hour ago. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so anyway, so and this is known as a skip gram model. Okay, and I'm going now to do some tech details, not many of them, but I'm going to introduce some technical details of how is this being done. Uh, so uh, the first technical detail is uh, uh, somehow related to Andre's questions before. Uh, so how I'm going to represent words because put, uh, be before putting them into a neural network and the encoding is uh, embarrassingly simple, okay? It's uh, so-called one fault encoding for words. It assumes that I'm able to order the dictionary in some order of terms, okay? Any order of terms would do. Okay, um, imagine alphabetical sort, okay? And uh, then I'm only interested in an index of a particular observed term in the dictionary. So I can get an index. I would say, okay, this is the term number seven and this is the term number 15 and 1059. Okay, and then I'm going to introduce as many uh, variables for representation for this one-hot encoding the, as uh, there are terms in the dictionary. 
So this is really high, 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 high dimensional representation, okay? And uh, also very sparse representation because all these very uh, in all these variables, each training example we will have one at one point, okay? For uh, I mean, only one variable we will ban, and all the others will be zero. Can I ask okay? something? Yeah. What's this business of replacing the set of terms with a set of integers that's bijected to it? Is that just yeah, because uh, so neural networks thinking about programming in C plus plus or what was going on? It's well, it... speaking, no advantage. Well, but this is because neural networks cannot do anything but uh, you know assume that every variable is just a real value numeric numeric variable with some ordering. No, no, and... I understand the one and the zero. Yeah, the yeah, yeah, stuff, but mm -hmm. there is no difference between using terms or using their indices. Is there? What's the difference? Well, the difference is if you uh, transform uh, terms to integers, yes. to index, yes. then the neural network might infer that they're, they're really ordered. Okay, and uh, they, uh, the neural network would then say, well, index uh, the term with index one is smaller than the term with index two. Aha, uh -huh, Matei. Yeah, because at some point, you, you will want to update the embedding vector of your work. Mm -hmm. And at that point, you know, you should all uh, update the matrix of embedding for some point. The row indexed by the term T. Anyway, it's a my, very minor point. We should probably just go on. I mean, at some point, you need indices, right? Yeah. Yeah, you need indices, but here you, you go even further and transform indices to this binary word. Okay. And that's, no, more, yeah. It's, uh, not a very good. Uh, so uh, the uh, as I said, there are two ways to to proceed now. You have now this one uh, encoding of words, and this is the context you would like to predict the central word. Okay, and this is the uh, so uh, a bit boring. Uh, um, um, no, but can, bit... can, back? can you explain a little bit of it? Oh, what? Okay, yeah, so... but I, I I wanted to explain the the, the next neural network, which okay, is just right. upside down. Sure. Okay. Yeah. You know? yeah. Yeah. So uh, there are two models, and I don't want to to yeah. to show you all the details of both models. And this is the one which is much easier to use because you can just obtain then your recording. Apparently, if you have the model like this, you put your work here, and then you read out the the so event. So this data flows upwards. Yeah, yeah. In this world, yeah, of course, for neural networks, sorry, yeah, oh, everything yeah. goes up. Okay. Yeah, okay. when you when you do the prediction, everything goes up. When you yeah. do the learning, everything goes down. Okay, okay. so the learning right thing... has to be up down. Uh, sorry, if you do left to right at the conference, people will boo you and. Uh, <laughs> not really. Left to right is almost as good as. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, so the, uh, the input layer is this huge representation of the word which gets uh, T neurons, size of T neurons. So there is a single one here. When you put the training example, there is a single one which corresponds to the index of the word you're observing. And now the neural network tries actually to predict what is the context, okay? And then uh, what it actually does, uh, you get here, uh, so these are the uh, groups of neurons in the output which correspond to different words in the context. So this is the last word in the context. And uh, for example, here, you won't have the, uh, when you do the prediction, you won't get zeros and ones, but you're going to get a probability distribution over all the possible words in your dictionary. And of course, you're going to predict the one which has the maximum probability, okay? So K was how many words back and forth you yes. were looking at? Yeah. Uh, so can you explain again what is one of these output thing is doing? So it's two so it's actually this is gonna be two K. Yes. Two K neurons. Yeah, two K groups of neurons. Okay. Uh, so each of these upper rectangles has size uh, T. T? Yeah. And so, then you have two key because two K because you want to predict all the words in the context. Right, and then uh -huh. okay. So you're now saying which word will I see in this? Yeah, position? yeah. In which this position, and this then position? in the next okay. position, and, and, and the next position. position. And you're getting, and you're getting the distribution. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. You get the, the uh, somehow a uh, uh, distribution for all uh, for each word in the sequence. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
And now you know what is the sequence of chords mm -hmm. because yeah. you, you have them ordered from left to right. You know something, but you don't know the sequence. Yeah, 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 sure. But you, uh, when you predict, I mean, you, you infer, uh, I mean, you, 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 this, uh, the, the ordering of the neurons from left to right is important. I mean, you, you know, yeah, this. Yeah, that's yeah. Because... okay. And then you have a single hidden layer. Okay, this is very, uh, this is tremendously simple neural network. And that is why I decided to go with this instead of some other methods, which are now, I mean, this is now considered almost a stone edge uh, embedding. Okay, but anyway, it's still, uh, it's still uh, widely used. Okay, so, uh, and uh, the, the very basic, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the hidden layer actually has N neurons. And this is where I'm going to read out my uh, representation of the word. Okay, so I'm going to say, well, this is uh, the, the, the states of these neurons here. When I do the prediction for a particular word, I'm going to read out the states, and though that will be my representation of the word as a double. Do you not actually intend to use the outputs for much? Well, um, if I'm not Google, I'm not interested in the outputs. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm, I mean, if I do machine learning, I'm only interested actually of what's going on. But there could still be things that you don't capture this way, right? For instance, if the first word that follows is highly correlated to the second in yeah. some way, then you're not you are not going that. to be able to find that. Okay. Yeah. No. I mean, it's still very, very naive. Right. So if I tell you the next word to actor is Brad, you don't you know that the word coming after that is not Joey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but that won't be captured. Right. I mean, it will be captured by the model because it will predict probably some low probability on, on all the other. I mean, you will know that. It'll kind of it. be bunched together. <laughs> you okay. get Brangelina, actually. I think. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, So now some more technical details because uh, we, I, I, I'll, I'll uh, bother you with technical details for about five minutes and then we'll go uh, and have a break. Okay. So uh, these technical details are, uh, I mean, they're not very demanding, but the notation is really, I mean, you have to be familiar with neural networks to a certain extent to, uh, to then understand this and I'll try to simplify it uh, as much as possible. Okay. So uh, in the input layer, you have T neurons, uh, the size of T neurons, uh, Xc for encoding the word Wc, okay? And this is uh, the sparse representation, which I was talking about, the one hot encoding uh, representation, okay? And then this layer is fully connected with the hidden layer in the bit, uh, in between, and the weight matrix, and the weight matrix are the matrix of the weights of the synapses connecting these two layers. And the weight matrix is obviously of dimensions m times t. Okay, just uh, okay. And then uh, the hidden layer, the states of the, the neurons in the hidden layer is then very simply calculated as a um, product of w and xc. Okay, and that's that is my encoding. As simple as that. But of course, I have to train the network so I get the right uh, Ws. Okay. And uh, arbitrary activation function can be used in this particular case because each neuron in the network, neuron in the network has an, uh, uh, an activation function, uh, which is usually the same for the, for the whole layer. And in particular context of the skip gram neural network, the selection which activation function is being used is not very very important but whatever you use you will get the outputs of the neurons of this layer and we are going to denote those outputs as v prime so okay. the activation function is the thing that will take the hidden layer and calculate what no we'll calculate the output so you have the... uh, each neuron has a state yes and uh, it has an output. And the transformation from the state to the output is the activation okay. function. Okay. And just activation. Now, I'm, well, you can imagine, I mean, uh, many neural networks would use this uh, step uh, activation function, which is the way to introduce nonlinearity in neural networks. But probably that's a separate lecture. Or, or, but you can imagine, it's just a transformation so of the state. No, activation okay, function is given in advance. That's just, that's just, that's just something, something yes, yes. which is given. What you are learning actually is only this W. 
Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. All the rest is just given. When you have a particular training example, actually, you know what is X. Well, you don't know what is V, but you know what is on the upper level, okay, on the output layer. Okay, in the output layer, the outputs are clustered in groups, okay, from minus K to plus K. And these groups correspond to the individual words in the context, okay? So you have Q, K words before and you have K words after. And you encode them with one code encodings. And uh, what you do actually, now you have uh, another matrix W prime, which, uh, which actually, uh, these are the weights uh, connecting the hidden layer with the output layer. Okay, so the Z are the states of the output layer. And then these uh, Zs might not sum up to one, okay? And then you have a very uh, simple activation function in the output layer of neural networks. What this does is uh, this does just uh, normalization. So we're looking at a particular phi now. Uh, yeah, but now uh, this is the phi for the output neurons. Mm -hmm. Okay, and yes, this yes. phi for the output neurons is very simple because what it does is just normalizes. In each group of neurons takes care that the outputs of these neurons sum up to one. So we can interpret that as a probability uh, distribution. Might be. Yeah, you hit them with X for some good reason. Uh, oh yeah. Yeah. yeah, logistic transformation, and yeah, yeah. okay, but <laughs> that's again a bit of a long story. Uh, so okay, but uh, uh, what is? I know something. Yeah, the previous activation functions actually you're rounding numbers to zero one until you're going. Oh no, no! Uh, take care that now in the hidden layer. These things are not uh, actually. You don't. Uh, you don't even need to to uh, round them to zero one because your tuple representation can have the deals. They will say you should use this activation function. You use this step function. Oh yeah, yeah. But, well, it could uh, be arc span. Right? Yeah, but uh, it can be arc stangers. Yeah, and usually it is arc stangers because uh, of the continuity and, and differentiability. Okay? Because then it's easier to learn. So the step function was used in this. Sorry, I wasn't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it is a kind of smooth set function. Yeah. And in general, then you don't get just zeros and ones, but you get real numbers. This yes. increasing value function for the data. Yeah, and increasing, yeah, bound, yeah, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, although uh, some of the activation functions are real numbers. Sorry, but can you just ask? So if you can you go back a little bit? Mm -hmm. So when you say that phi is arc span, well, v is a vector. So if oh, yeah, arc this is a norm. Yeah, something? of course. Uh, this is just applying element wise. Oh, ele wait, what? Oh, element wise. Oh. Element. You apply phi element wise. Okay. Yeah, Sorry, next... this is like computer yes, science yes. sloppy. Okay. Yeah. So that's actually my next question. Well, here you apply this element wise, while in the other one you look at all the top in all the components at once. Sorry, but in the next one, yeah. you you have to look at the full vector. It's not component wise. It so is still like component wise different. because you you actually okay you you sum up in the in uh, here, but then uh, it's component wise. Still, each component is being normalized with the sum. Okay, so it's still component wise, and every uh, activation function is used in the single neuron. Okay, but yeah, of course, this is uh, this is just a bad notation, right? I think it's mostly for the purposes of understanding. You see this for the first time, you want the type. So yeah, much, as we say. In sure. The sure, 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 sure. Yeah, yeah. And I have to write this yeah. somehow smartly to, to, <laughs> uh, to make it more specific. Okay, so yeah, anyway, this is now what happens when I predict. Okay, so I put uh, X into uh, my neural network. And I have all these Zs as, as, as the outputs, okay? And then how I guide my training. So the trick for guiding the training in, in uh, neural networks is to define a loss and the objective function, 
Okay, the objective function being uh, a function which tells me whether my uh, network does a good job or not. Okay, and what I'm uh, going to do is to use the negative log likelihood of the context given the word. Okay, so what I want to maximize is the uh, given a word, I would like to maximize the uh, probability of the right context. Okay, and of course, we are uh, in order to be able to calculate this efficiently. Of course, we are going to uh, assume that the, the 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 words in the context are independent. Well, how realistic is this? You can judge yourself, but <laughs> this is what is being done for the purpose of efficiency of calculation. Okay, and then of course this uh, tremendously simplifies. And then you need another round of simplification before you go uh, and you can simplify your, your uh, objective function to this one here, okay? I mean, this is just some boring arithmetic in between, okay? And then once you have this objective function, you can use standard backpropagation algorithm for neural network, which is known like for 50 years. And uh, what the, what it does, it's a gradient descent search uh, for finding optimum of this uh, objective function. Okay, and once you train your network, you're able to do these kind of things. Okay, I mean this is just a sanity check now whether my work to back uh, works fine. Okay, so I would like to ask myself what are the similar words to France. Okay, so I put France as a word in and uh, obtain an encoding, and then I find those words in my dictionary which have similar encodings in the in the so in nearby space. in the Euclidean space. Yes, we're very very close in the, the Euclidean space. Okay, and apparently he figures out that uh, you know I mean if you use a country name in a certain context, of course in similar context other country names appear. Okay. And of course, the uh, neighbors of France are Austria, Belgium, etc. Et 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 and Europe is a country. And Europe is a country, of course. I mean, mm -hmm. also for right. language models, probably. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, anyway. And then, of course, I mean, uh, the second column is even, even worse, probably, in a way of what is her, who is what. What's the third one? <laughs> SAT, what is that? SAT. Well, I don't know. Is that kind of Indian God or? Well, okay. The word yeah. following Christ is also kind of expected. <laughs> of course, I mean this is provocative, but yeah, I mean those are words which come in the, in, in the same context, right? And and uh, this is fine. And of course, also, I mean, what is uh, what is also nice is that the word uh, to back also uh, captures these uh, relations between words. So if you say I have a relationship France Paris, uh, give me similar relationships. Uh, he will provide, and this is like the difference between Fran uh, the representation of France and Paris. And you would like to see whether there are other words with similar discrepancies or, or differences between the vectors, and you will get Japan. Japan now, this is wrong. I think the Florida uh, capital is Miami still, or? I know. No? no? Has it, yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, of course. Okay, so I'm... Okay, so here's a good bit of thumb. If you are thinking about the capital of a, of a state, it's not it's any not of the, the city that you know that, that, yeah. that comes yeah. to your mind. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm Put your I, finger I, somewhere in the middle of the state that probably yeah, yeah. for this. <laughs> well, anyway, so yeah, you can judge yourself here. Uh, it's interesting to, to see that France subsumes Paris subsumes France, right? France, Paris, big bigger. But Japan Tokyo is in a similar relationship to France and Dallas. Oh so, yeah. Yeah, oh, where is the food? Due to me, yeah, but, uh, and this one is also problematic. But anyway, I mean, because, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, so anyway, this is what word to back uh, really is about. Mozart plays the violin and Merkel plays German. <laughs> So this is uh, this is again this is a Stone Age uh, GPT. Right? Uh, 
Uh, this is a Stone Edge language model. Yeah. yeah. How old is this? Uh, like uh, almost ten years. Oh, okay, yeah, Stone Edge. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So this is about the edge. So, if you ask today, America, uh, uh, Germany. Ah, sorry. Yeah. Will you still be getting the current? Uh, well, it depends uh, when are you going to retain your model. Now, uh, and that brings us to the point of how we train our model. I mean, War to Back model is usually not trained by ourselves. We would just download a trained model because Google trains that on a huge corpuses of, 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 of documents. And then if they retrain recently, they will figure out that maybe virtual semester is not uh, uh, um, the prime minister of, of Germany. And they have grown on some San Maurelio, Maurelio, Marco Yeah, might be, <laughs> might be. I mean, that's a problem of Czech GPT, right? Because he, he cannot cope with the current events. Okay? And that for is now. a big disclaimer for now. Because retraining of such a huge model is really a problem, right? And yeah, and uh, work to back models should be retrained all the time because they want to predict as precisely as possible what is the next word I'm going to type in in this Google window. Uh, sorry? Say, continuously train instead of. Oh, yeah, experiment. it can. I mean, uh, neural networks are nice because they can always be continuously trained. You can always start with the pre-trained network with some weights, and then you add new examples, and you get the, the training signal, and you, you can train them all the time. Then why is it okay? You, you need a power, you need electric power plant to yeah. do it? Yeah. I mean, if you have, now imagine, I mean, this is a small model, which I showed, but language model, which is used by GPT, uh, a chat. Mm -hmm. is uh, uh, like uh, several billions of neurons, okay? Yeah, so I mean, this is quite a challenge. Mm -hmm. I mean, in terms of electrical power, if not, you know, the, the power the bill. Of the investment of the billion dollars is, is providing the training. Sure, sure. And that will only be enough for a near moment? <laughs> no, I mean, for just for electricity bills. I'm not sure, but uh, you yeah. <laughs> know. Anyway, so uh, now uh, uh, that happened in 2013. Okay, so it's yeah, it's the 10th anniversary. Okay, and uh, of work to back, and then doc to back was a kind of uh, strange thing we, we, we debated with Mate at certain point. I mean, doc to back tries now to uh, uh, to translate uh document objects not only words but the whole documents into tuples okay and you can train that but it appears that actually the best solution would be just to calculate the mean of the, the of the word to back for all the words in your document the mean value the average okay that is better than you know learning some doc to back and that was admitted by Mikol of itself so what happened, himself, sorry. What happened in 2014 that signified the passage from Stonex to the right? Well, well the, no, the, now the, 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 King Man, right? yeah. the inception of the modern world happened in 2014 when somebody invented so-called variational autoencoders. But okay. I will tell you uh, uh, just a little bit about variational autoencoders because I would like to make a break now for okay. like 10 minutes. Yes. Okay. And then continue because, and of course, I don't know whether you notice or not, but they haven't mentioned any graphs yet. And we, <laughs> we also noticed you're on 27 of the 46. Well, but the, 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 the second part is easier. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, Good. About five minute break. Five minutes. We're probably going to 15 minutes. Right? Yeah, I don't. Okay. So let's say we uh, continue at, is that? What is that plot line for us? Yeah, let's start at uh, eleven twenty-five. Uh, so good. 
Mm, don't worry about this modern age, okay? So I'm going to talk about when I come to agenda of what we are trying, uh, what we will do with the uh, Agda graphs at the end, I will return to this topic. So uh, it happened in 2014, but that was only the uh, inception of the idea of alternative, uh, I mean, autoencoders in general are alternative neural network structure for embeddings okay for training embeddings it's not as simple as the one i showed here so this is really tremendously simple okay variational autoencoders do another trick but uh but let me now continue with the talk and i will return to that at the end and the these uh, it took it took a while so only in 2019 a comprehensible version of the original paper came out, okay, in 2019, okay? And then afterwards, many, many variational autoencoders uh, architectures were proposed for this and that, among other things also for embeddings. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, we are in the second half and we have not mentioned graphs yet. Okay. So, uh, but uh, there are two crucial components for uh, actually uh, dealing with graphs now in place. And we have context as a very, very important, uh, 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 important uh, concept, which helps us uh, to uh, build training data for embeddings. And the other building block, which was important from the first part of the talk was the skip gram architecture. Because now we, we know how to use the training data to learn a reasonable embedding, okay? So now we have these two building blocks and uh, we should just generalize them to graphs, okay? Very easy, okay? And I, I think I'm, I will be done in about 15 minutes and not more than that, okay? So uh, uh, let's see what is capturing uh, a word context, okay? Uh, a, a context of a word is, capture, uh, is captured uh, using a sliding window, okay? Very basic thing, okay? I, uh, I consider the text to be a, a sequence of words and I just slide the window through my text and I have uh, designated words in the middle and the rest is the context in each of these uh, sequences in the sliding window. Okay, and now what is a sliding window for graphs? I mean, it would be very nice if we want to generalize the idea. I would say, well, it's the neighborhood graph. Well, yeah, it would be nice if I say, I mean, the, the basic thing is the neighborhood graph, okay? But the neighborhood a graph is still very, very far away from a sequence. Which you I want to arrive at the sequence eventually? Yeah, I would like to arrive to a sequence. And uh, of course, now uh, here to, to do a sequence from this graph here, it's not obvious how to, to, to proceed with that. Now, anybody who read literature on this would know what, what was the proposed solution. It's quite obvious, right? Or maybe not. I don't know. For machine learning, a basic operation on graph is a random walk. Oh. <laughs> okay, but that's for machine learning. I don't think that in graph theory, I mean, if you talk to somebody from graph theory, it will say, well, <laughs> you wouldn't care less about rubber blocks. But yeah, in machine learning, like that's, uh, and, and, and that is what we are going to do. I mean, that's the only additional step we are going to add to all this. So mm. I have an honest question. So it's, there seems to be a lot of this stuff in machine learning. Oh, we already know how to embed into R to the N. So whatever problem we're solving, let us know, let us find out how to reduce it to R to the N. And now we're saying, okay, we have sequences, let us reduce to sequences. But yeah. for instance, if I put on my functional programming hat for two minutes, then it looks like you're using zippers there. So you're using a location mm -hmm. and what's around it. So here the natural answer would be to my mind, you look at the neighborhood graph. And but uh, there isn't this instinct that therefore whatever we were doing before, we should be generalizing to neighborhood graphs. 
Yes, and it might be uh, that it's there are yeah. some encodings. Uh, uh, it's not that hard. If you have a fixed number of vertices for your neighborhood, you can do some kind of back of words model because you can count uh, actually all the possibilities for this small. You know, you have triplets mm -hmm. and you have. So what I'm thinking yeah. is, well, you just observe the neighborhoods that you see. Like, there's nothing special mm -hmm. about that being a sequence. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. just course. a bunch of different contexts, so yeah. a bunch of different little graphs. Well, I was just trying to reply that it might be that somebody considered that, mm -hmm. but for me, this was the the most obvious path, and this is the path which is which is the most usually. Uh, I mean, uh, most of machine learning went into this direction, so we wanted to get this, okay. uh, you know, like like, like okay, the basic sure. strokes. Maybe they know something we don't, but somehow. Yeah. Taking these random walks is good. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but some of them are also observing the, uh, you know, the, the context in terms of uh, counting uh, what kind of uh, structures are be, are uh, appear in the neighborhood of a certain node. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you take your graph and you just look at its surrounding, like the, a ball of radius k around the vertex okay. or something yeah. like that. Yeah, and then you yeah. see. Yeah. Right. So I need more power plants. <laughs> Isn't an issue also that it's not a fixed size? Because, uh, yeah. The context of the word is always a fixed size or a neighborhood of a that is why I'm saying uh, uh, they observed, for example, only but the neighborhood of three vertices. That's hard to define. But they were actually uh, some of the approaches I know they uh, they uh, so they would enumerate all the triplets all the graphs on the three nodes, and they will calculate how many of them appear in the certain neighbor. Mm -hmm. And that would be a, a, a fixed level context, and then they learn from that. Okay, okay. so that's an, alternative. Okay. that's an alternative approach, but it's a good mm -hmm. comment, actually, and I, I haven't included it because this was... Uh, so, uh, now, the way I uh, introduce this usually is that, that I say, well, we we have a special kind of graph we can deal with, and that's the path graph. Okay, okay. If if we have a path graph of size n, we know how to deal uh, with that particular because that's a sequence, right? And since we already have a solution for sequence, uh, we uh, can apply our usual magic of a, a sliding window, okay, and go into this and build uh, the same uh, training examples that we built for uh, uh, for uh, words, okay? But instead, now we have the vertices here, okay? So the idea is that in the random world, you're not allowed to go back. Oh, you can, but I, I'm showing now a particular class of graphs where I can apply word to back directly. Okay, so if my graph is sequence, I mean, I know it, of that is very hard. Yeah, but you can go back and forth, and I will show. Uh, I mean, how you can, uh, and then of course, uh, I mean, this won't be a proper graph. I mean, the walks itself, they are not proper path graphs because some of the nodes can repeat them. I mean, and it depends. But we, uh, the, the, we are going to interpret the walk as a path graph. Okay, and allow for some of the vertices to have the, to share the same label. Okay, so that's ready for training an embedded neural network, and that was actually the first uh, the first paper said, well, that's it. We do random walks, but uh, uh, so so by doing random walks, what you mean is you now turn your graph into a bunch of paths. By yes. walking around statistically randomly sufficiently, yeah, and you get you can actually calibrate this right. The more power, the, the more the more you can, the more processing power you have, the more random graphs you produce, and yeah. so on. Yeah, which is important. Yeah, sure, have to sure. Yeah. And of course, I mean, you don't optimize just your uh, your uh, computational time uh, in terms of number of examples, but sometimes you generate uh, enough. Mm -hmm. Training examples because you need a lot of them to. Is there a theorem that says that a small number of random graphs in a, in a graph of sorry, sorry small number of random walks in a graph of size n is always enough? Do we have a graph? Yeah. What is the question? If there's a theorem that says that a small number of random walks in a graph of size n is always enough, enough to identify the graph. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
you're doing mm -hmm. with one value of oh, just a very long value of oh, you get that like no. Is there a difference between yeah, one there and there about making distribution? Yeah. What kind of loss is that? What kind of loss is that? Okay. Uh, the loss is actually distributed to me. And essentially, for a very long time, the loss is the most easiest to be And I think it's not actually the probability of what we're going to do. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but that's the, the that is what was was being used uh, for in page rank then, because page rank is actually calculating the centrality degree the degree centrality very efficiently because you just do some random box and then okay, but yeah, that's <laughs> again a separate maybe okay. yeah, yeah 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 okay. So uh, now the first idea was to make just a, gen uh, a general random walk on a graph. And the general random walk starting in some node uh, here, for example, it uh, randomly samples the neighborhood, the neighbors, and then chooses, uh, um, it assumes uh, uniform distribution uh, for probabilities uh, to choose uh, any of the neighbors, and then it goes to the neighbor, and then it repeats until uh, a, a requested length of the of the walk is uh, is achieved. Okay, very very simple. So you can start in V in V one, and of course you can return as as uh, um, as you said before. So you can go here, you can return back, and you know you you just want to achieve a certain length. Okay, which is prescribed. You probably want to start over randomly many times, right? So yeah, yeah, and of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, the random walk will be repeated as many times as the number of examples you would need to achieve. Yeah. So each random walk will give you uh, typically one example, or even it can be break down in many examples. It depends on what is the relation between the length of the walk and the context you're interested in. Okay. Mm. Uh, there was a comment. Okay. Sorry. You do want to get stuck in yeah. like two in these two areas in this graph that shows the yeah, but they're kind of the same. on the other hand, you want to sort of sample the whole graph. Well, I will show you what you would like to do, and this yeah. is parameterized now, okay? okay. Because uh, I mean this is a general random walk. Yeah. And the general random walk, of, of course, now you can ask yourself, well, uh, I mean a conservative walker would always walk in his neighborhood, right? And a very liberal one would, you know, explore. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's like, and and this is what we are going to talk about in just two slides, okay? So, um, so there are uh, instead of um, a random, a general random walk, what is being used when encoding graphs is biased random walks. Okay, the biased random walk introduces the uh, dependence of what are you going to do in the next step is based of what you have previously done. So if you moved uh, from you uh, in your graph, if you moved from U to B, then the probability uh, to move from uh, V to W depends of, on uh, what happened before, okay? Something like this, okay? And this is the, the, the bias we are going to introduce because we would like to distinguish between these mm -hmm. uh, like conservative walks and, and walks which are quite liberal, okay? And maybe uh, then get different embeddings. One, they take care of exploring the very uh, large neighborhood of the graph or the very small. Okay, and uh, there are two, uh, well, you can parameterize like in, in different ways, but I'm showing a, a particular parameterization that was used by node to back, which became a kind of golden standard for embeddings of graph vertices. Okay, and uh, so uh, the extreme bias you can uh, impose on one hand is to have a breadth first walk. Okay, and this is known like a, a, a traversal uh, in traversal of, of, of trees, we know what is breadth first. So you you first uh, systematically go through your neighborhood, right? From through, through a neighborhood in terms of you go 
uh, so you go one step in one direction, but then you uh, you somehow tend to return back, and then you go and explore elsewhere. Et so you somehow this conservative walker, the bread first walker, would uh, only stick to its neighborhood when it starts in a certain mode. Okay, as opposed to a liberal one uh, who would say, "Well, I like to explore. I would rather not go back at any point." So it goes further and further, and in five steps it goes in, in completely different, or in, yeah, in five steps it goes into a completely uh, other part of the graph. And now, uh, is it smart to do both and combine them uh, in a single training uh, data set? Well, that's not what we do. I mean, in machine learning, that's probably not smart because then you're, you will not be able to use a good embedding because you will get examples like this and examples like that. You will mix them together and it's questionable whether you will be able to, to learn any kind of method because it's just too heterogeneous data. Maybe you should somehow parameterize and say, well, I want to see what kind of embedding I'm going to get if I'm conservative and what kind of, of, of uh, embedding I'm going to get if I'm, uh, if I'm uh, liberal. Okay, and this is parameterized in no to back. This is parameterized very, very simple. Okay, so imagine that I'm uh, in, uh, in the node, uh, in, that the random walker is in the node V, okay? And the random walker now decides where, where to go, but he also knows because we have biased a random walk, he knows that previously he's been in U. Okay, so we know U, we know V, and now we want to calculate the, uh, I mean, we want to randomly choose the next node. Okay, so uh, we are going to assume that uh, we are going to parameter a situ situation with two uh, parameters P. Uh, one over p is the probability that I'm going to go back. Okay, so p is just a positive real. And is it crazy if it is a positive real? It almost doesn't matter what you say. There will be two parameters. Yeah, yeah, but this is then probability or propensity. I don't know. I mean, yeah, it doesn't matter. I mean, some kind of normalization to me would be needed anyway. So yeah, it's uh, in this particular case, it's a positive integer. And uh, that's the uh, one over P is the probability that you're going to return back. Okay, I don't know why they, in particular, they use this parameterization because they want to compare this with one. The one is, uh, the probability of one is the probability that you're going to stick to your neighbor. Okay, so that's the that's the only fixed propensity here. Okay, and then you have uh, with p, you say no, I want to be even more conservative than staying in my neighborhood. I will be so conservative that I'm going to get back to the to my origin in the next step. Okay, so this is extreme conservatism. This is like, uh, you know, uh, how should I say, uh, Sredina. <laughs> Modern. <laughs> Modern, okay. And uh, this is extreme uh, exploratory, okay? So with Q parameter, you say how, uh, you, that you want to go to the, uh, to the part of the graph which are not connected to your current context of U and V in any way, okay? So, you know, these are the two parameters, okay? And this is this can be really put into this framework, uh, which I showed here, but you need another. So uh, this uh, um, conditional probability will depend on the previous two nodes, not only on the single node. And mm -hmm. that's the only. Thing. If you're on this, if you're doubly if you're not connected to this. Because yeah, the yeah, yeah. So it's very important. What that, or not uh, w2 and w3 are not connected to you okay they're connected to v but they're not connected to you so uh, they're not connected to where i've been okay so far yeah or where i've been in my previous two steps right good so uh this is how it is done actually if we want now uh, a second order random a bias random walk actually this is the probability distribution I is defined and the and this is the alphas i need in the particular formula i showed two, two slides before so this is just uh, that i can reparameterize everything in and, and say how uh and uh, actually use the proper bias random walks okay 
and uh, return parameter p for the high values of p, uh, which are uh, 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 high values of p actually encourage exploration because what happens if p is very high, this the probability of returning to you will be obviously very low. Okay. And then the high, on the other hand, the high um, in out parameter, the low parameters of Q, uh, the low values of Q encourage exploration. Okay, so uh, if Q is low, then this probability becomes high, and then I go and explore. And uh, usually the typical settings here are uh, setting P to one, it's exploratory. And uh, Q to 0 0.5, that's exploratory, and we call that setting macroscopic because it will go and explore with random walks. It will explore the graph as a whole. And the other setting of P equals 1 and Q2 is conservative. It's microscopic because it will only explore the local network. But that depends on the degree. Yeah, if you go back to the figure. I mean, if B has a lot of neighbors to the right, then actually we will always start. I mean, let's say that Q is two and P is one, mm -hmm. right? But then there is one edge to go back, there might be a million to go over the right. So oh, yeah, but the, but the, the probability of those will be. Uh, oh, so that's the probability for all of them to the cumulative one, yeah. yeah. That's the cumulative one. Otherwise, yeah. you're forced yeah, yeah, to put yeah. Q I equals two. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. It's a bit misleading. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thanks for that comment. I mean, yeah. I so the choice that you're making is: Am I staying in the neighborhood? Am I going back, or yeah. am I going? Yeah. Out of the and actually, this is going outside the neighborhood, and okay. it's, uh, yeah. again, it's and a misleading. Is, I thought okay. it's a very yeah. smart. Uh, so uh, once you decide that you go out of the neighborhood, you pick. Uniformly at random between the options that lead there. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Uh, good. Okay. And what happens now uh, <coughs> if I do one or the other? Okay. So on the left hand, uh, so uh, here are two uh, the same graph uh, colored with the, uh, so the color here is the tuple, the embedding. The tuple representation of a, of a vertex. Okay, so if you see similar colors here, that means that similar embeddings were uh, calculated for a particular node. Okay, and we are if we are very conservative. What happens with the embedding? The embedding itself actually identifies neighborhoods. Okay, because agents which are walking here, they are going to walk around this uh, neighborhood, and this uh, agent will go. Uh, uh, is going to walk here, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so some neighborhoods that may be similar in terms of they are related to each other, but uh, you know, different colors, any similar colors doesn't mean anything. To you, okay, just not to be uh, distracted by that. I mean, these two colors are similar but different, and you know, different colors just means that you know these embeddings are quite far away. Okay, so. This kind of embedding would say that uh, similar nodes stick together in the graph. Okay. Now, uh, the, when I say uh, that I want to have exploratory uh, setting, now the, the interpretation of the embedding here is quite different. Okay? It takes some time uh, to realize when you analyze this picture that actually it um, it identifies through group, uh, three groups of points. Okay, so one embedding says, uh, one, I mean, uh, the similar embeddings in yellow color here says, these are, most of these nodes are peripheral. Okay, at the very edge of the graph. Okay, you see here, here, and uh, graph, uh, points that are just, you know, really disconnected. And then there is one which is really fully connected. Okay. Is it an outlier or not? It's difficult to realize, but it's certainly uh, you can see that, uh, that, that you know either periphery or very 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 central point. I think this would be a high between. Um, okay, and uh, 
I haven't done many sanity check uh, tests. I mean, I, I've done a sequence, and the sequence is very obvious what will happen because only the two extremes will be different encoded, and all the others will be. But, uh, but here I'm trying to explain the intuition, and the intuition is that uh, so you have periphery, then you have nodes which are somehow not the peripheral, uh, but close to the periphery, and then you have blue nodes. Uh, uh, most of them are being the ones which are bridges. We have uh, that have really high betweenness. That means that they are important for you know bridging the neighborhood. Okay. What about a big red? Well, it should be uh, it should be very central. But you see the 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 yellow one here. It should be central as well. But somehow it's yellow. Okay. So that's the only outlier. With this one, I'm not surprised. So it's just like the size, uh, the size, I would say it's between us. Okay. Between the centrality, uh, would I know? Uh, okay. Between the centrality means the number of shorter steps mm -hmm. in the graph that go to the rate, the ratio of shorter paths uh, in the graph that go to the particular node. Okay, and that is the why uh, the size is here depicted, so we can see what the correspondence between. Uh, kind of the so if I'm asking something else, so here for each node, what a vector, and then you mentioned clustering there. Yeah, two color and three. Is it clear there are five clusters on one and three in the other, which is obvious from the. I mean, like. Like my time, you decide the number of clusters first, and then do the clustering. Uh, yeah, you do the clustering, and you do you, you do your heuristic decision on the number of clusters. It's just, I mean, this is a very vague illustrative example of what would be the difference between the two and the group. I don't know what is the lesson learned for other graphs, but yeah, I mean, this is uh, we, we, we should. I mean, we, we, if we try to apply this kind of parameter. We, we should think about what would be the correct. Yeah. It looks like uh, with the macroscopic approach, you can detect rich definitions and that are connecting different uh, parts of the library. Or the bridges yeah. over. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. But, but on the other hand, we already calculated the between us, so we would know to a certain extent, right? No, it, now it depends whether we want the, the recommender system to know or to see the macroscopic view. I mean, that mm -hmm. that's the important question, and I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, we have to debate about that. Good. And uh, actually, now node to back algorithm is quite obvious. Okay. So what we are going to do is just, uh, I mean, the first step, we pre-compute these alphas for the biased uh, random blocks. We initialize the set of blocks to empty set. And then for each node in the uh, graph, we perform uh, a fixed number of random blocks of length L. And from these uh, random blocks, uh, we extract with a sliding window, we extract training data. And then we use skip ground neural network on the training data to do the trick of embedding. Okay. And now we have every vertex in the, uh, every vertex in my uh, graph can be mapped to a couple. <clears throat> then I can do machine learning from here on. Okay. Now, uh, of course, the question is, whether this is useful also for edges. Well, uh, a, a note to back has been used also uh, for um, embedding of edges. And the embedding of edges is just a function of, of embedding of, the, uh, of one node and the other node. And um, the typical uh, thing that would be used is a concatenation of the two embedded vectors. And then actually you have embedding of a dimension to, uh, to M. But also the original paper of not to back uh, only suggested this, uh, like four alternatives for how to, uh, how to calculate the embedding of the edges, but haven't done any kind of exploration of what would be really to be done. Okay. Uh, but this is just to say that, you know, if you want to do a uh, link prediction, of course, you should take care of transforming the encodings of the vertices to, to, into encodings of the edges. 
you want to really learn on the edges. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so, okay, the timeline here is 2014, uh, deep walk was introduced, and that was the idea of using random walks for embeddings. And then uh, Grover and Lescois in 2016 parameterized the random walks into bias walks, okay? Uh, to, to, and, and it works, I mean, in many then uh, machine learning applications that works better. Uh, deep walk just goes and, you know, uh, puts together all, all kinds of different random walks. Okay, and then there are, there are uh, of course, autoencoders are also being now used for graphs as well. Uh, edge to vec is a really interesting approach uh, where they combine skip gram with these autoencoders. And uh, of course, numer uh, num numerous variational autoencoders on graphs are being used. And maybe now it's time to explain what is, uh, briefly explain what is uh, autoencoder. So the autoencoder, imagine now that you have an input layer here. And let's say that this input layer is just a sequence of words, OK, uh, with some length. Uh, minus k to k, OK? Now, uh, the, the way we, uh, we were uh, doing this with, uh, uh, with uh, skip gram was to expand this into the context. The autoencoder says, no, actually, what I'm going to do, I don't need any kind of context. I'm going to do an the neural network architecture, which will predict the same thing that was, that was given as an input. Mm -hmm. Okay. Even more uh, 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 opposed. Okay. Now, of course, if uh, if uh, you, you would like to uh, here to infer identity, okay, which sounds very stupid, but then if you have constraints that uh, on on what kind of weights you are able to use, autoencoders seem to work. And then, of course, you have also some uh, probabilistic uh, constraints of, of what is going on here. And variational autoencoders are actually successful because they put right kind of constraints of, of, of this reconstructing variability. And here you have deep neural network, but deep because uh, what we saw before was really shallow. And then you have deep neural network, and it is really deep means more than one layer. Yeah, okay. and many more. Many, many more. Okay. okay, and this already sounds like uh, a GPT and, and, and a real uh, language model. Okay, because this is sequence to sequence, right? So the point here is that we're <coughs> learning the representations from these word vectors. And yeah, and here vectors. is the representation, yeah. Okay, so if the thing in the middle yeah. has dimension 2k, this should be super easy. Yes, yes, exactly. I mean, that is how uh, every lecture on autoencoder starts, because, yes. yeah. And of course, even if, if this is less, if you have a single real number, you can do the indexes, right? Mm -hmm. For the training data. Well, I mean, if you remember the indexes and in some part of your data, then you can do quite well, of course. I mean, imagine doing C of your training data. Mm -hmm. So, so we like, must compressing. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> yes, you're compressing yeah. and decompressing. Yeah. 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 Yes. So the question then is how much you tend to compress, apparently. Well, I think we need another lecture of variational autoencoders in near future. I mean, I'm preparing one for the students now in the second semester. Okay. So yeah, I mean, certainly I, I can go into that like in two months or so. Okay. Yeah. So not next because week. this uh, uh, not next week. Okay. No, no, no. I mean, this requires a bit of yeah. Time. I mean, it's. Uh, it's completely other. Uh, I mean, it also requires quite some knowledge about uh, usual neural networks, which I have to introduce before going into into how uh, we actually train autoencoders, so they not become trivial co uh, compressors and decompressors. Right? Okay. Okay. Thank you. So.
yeah, just yeah, sorry, just the uh, Agda Graf's agenda. <laughs> I forgot that actually the last slide is meaningful. So now, how is this connected to Agda Graf's? Okay, so yeah, I mean, uh, certainly we would like to explore word to vec, and um, already Matei found a code to vec variant of word to vec, which is trained on code. Okay. Uh, the difference being yeah it takes into account your uh, the structure of the code oh, yeah. yeah. okay of course node back and edge to back variants on the graphs and uh, maybe even embeddings based on variational autoencoders would come into play. And uh, of course, the interesting question is whether we should combine different embeddings, because now we are talking about, you know, work to vec. We, we have these properties. We, we can, we, we, uh, Matei already has done a uh, bag of words. And now it's a question what would be maybe an optimal combination? Okay. Uh, so a lot of ideas. And that is why I would like also in the second semester to lecture students in advanced machine learning on variational autoencoders. So maybe some helping hand from the students and seminar works will be expected here mm -hmm. okay. uh, on the Agda graphs. And uh, the, of, uh, now uh, as introduction to the next uh, seminar, which won't be on variational autoencoders, obviously, it's that these machine learning models uh, based on the embeddings are typically uh, then very hard to interpret, okay? Because you get a mapping, right? Your training objects are obscured into some real tuples of real numbers. And uh, next week, I'm going to show some symbolic machine learning methods for learning on graphs directly. So they, they just explicitly take into account the edges and you have models which are interpretable in that case and readable. So the recommendation of such readable model would say, well, I'm recommending this because this is connected to that, et cetera. Which, which is quite the opposite to what uh, 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 an embedding would say. Like, this is because my Randall Walker <laughs> visited that not, or, you know, it's very hard to interpret what really happened. And that's it. Okay, thank you. Yep. Um, <clears throat> okay. So, can you in fact that our graphs are very close to being directed acyclic, and uh, the places where the graph is not acyclic, you actually indicate that in fact the source code by saying record or some kind of model where you make usual definitions. Um, <clears throat> so we are not working with arbitrary graphs. Uh, can you take advantage of that? Our graphs are not arbitrary. Yeah, yeah, and actually, at a certain point, uh, I was uh, I was going into uh, into direction of uh, uh, transcending the the usual graph because you can have this the adjacency uh, matrix of the graph is being used when you do random walks, and this adjacency matrix uh, can be asymmetric and can be also non-zero one, which okay. means that you can have weights also on the. On the, so in general, you can cope with also with graphs which have weights on the on the uh, edges, okay. and the edges can have direction as well. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And uh, that means also that the random walker will obey the directions. Mm -hmm. So if we're recommending things. The thing that you actually do in Agda is you are facing some pole, mm. unfinished source code. Yeah. And I think what you really want to know is not what are all the things that I should I will be using in this pole. It's what's the first thing I should use in this pole. And that's just the top of the G that's going to be in there. Yeah. So that's something to think about. So it's yeah, maybe I, not so important. It's 
well it it might be important because i uh, it might uh, pro, uh, if we think about what kind of uh, parameterization for example we are going to use for not to back it might translate to some logical uh, right. so parameterization but i walking you know, in a, yeah so so at first sight maybe something that's extremely conservative and yeah because you don't care what you will be using five steps from now, you just want to know what is the next step. And what is the next step you would like to take? <clears throat> Let's see. Uh, that's my basic intuition, but I think that we need to discuss that with Matei as well, right. and uh, whoever else is interested in this discussion, because but hmm? it might also be quite asymmetric. What the, what the next step would be depends on how you got there. How you got there, yes. of course. Yeah, this context is actually yeah. very have to be taken into account. But this context can be taken into account by the lear the second layer of learning. Once you have the embeddings, you would like to see, you know, what what works where. Mm -hmm. And this additional yeah. mapping, which will happen after you have the tuples, you learn the model, and that model should capture this kind of connection to, uh, of your current okay. context with the, mm -hmm. with the. I still have the feeling that it's too coarse to say that the nodes are the definitions because now then you're just looking at the globally defined things it still feels to me that the nodes should be like you should stick in the whole graph somehow or at least most of it because because i don't think you, i don't think you can learn much well it seems to me that how they put this um which things are global definitions uh, and which things actually help you solve problems is two different things the global definitions is the things that user thinks are relevant in the future. Exactly. Yeah. But for instance, the user might be using the same trick over and over, mm. deeply embedded in the middle of the groups, mm. and that could be informative. I don't know, not sure. Well, and we have the source code, right? That's it. Yeah. The, the contextual information that we learn with. So if you think of very manual theorist groups where that you that you sometimes would do with um, reflection. Yeah. So same say monad kind of operating the monad. So it's just a sequence of equations and yeah. commuting things and contrast and so on. Yeah. Where there is lots of context, right? And we know that now if I'm using the lemma somewhere, which is something like cancel, yeah. blah blah blah, uh, it's coming after sequence of these yes. things. Yes. So, and that's that's the place where you have to write. Right, I think so. I think that would be that it's, it's, it's kind of useless if, if it's if I if I see that that lemma constructed to, with with that particular structure is just related to some other definition of the lemma that I'm using. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's not going to do really much. Yeah. I mean it's it, uh, maybe the way to maybe a, a relevant analogy is this. If we're just looking at the top level definitions, that's like trying to learn only beginnings of sentences and nothing else. Yes. I was uh, actually I, I I don't know I yeah. wonder what's going on. But then on the other hand, in the in each vertex we have the source code. We right? have you have the yeah. trees all the time. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So actually, yeah. I mean, we can. Uh, yeah, well, we should probably combine embeddings. I'm not sure, yeah. or maybe put everything in a single yeah. graph and then. And there's also some expert knowledge there that might be relevant. For instance, when you say. Okay, what are typical ways to start writing the proof? You will say, well, it's usually it's either a lambda abstraction or I'm going to apply something. Mm -hmm. And so, if you're applying something, you know that what you should be looking at is the top of the tree, which says we're applying something. Mm -hmm. But then you also have to go all the way to the left, to the bottom, to see what it to is that you're applying. Is yeah. For instance, so <laughs> there are some there's some semantic meaning to these things, which might, which at least. <laughs> humans probably think are relevant. I don't know if they are relevant. That is why I so think instance, symbolic... Walk, to the, walk yeah. to the left of an apply yeah. might be something that yeah. is, should be popular. Yeah. That is why I would also like to uh, to try with Matei. Uh, I mean, he actually did mostly symbolic machine learning mm -hmm. on graphs. And I think this is relevant okay. as well. So because we'll see that next week. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. No, I have no idea what this after graph can one say you articulate so yeah. I think it um, is. 10,000 so, nodes, so 10,000 definitions, 200,000 edges. These are essentially, you can take, you take all the source code of the thing that Egbert has written during Corona, 
and then you turn it into lots of abstract syntax trees, and you know when one definition references another one, and then you get the job. How do you detect the two nodes are the same? What do you mean? I mean, two people could be having the same definition. I mean, I could go today to other one after definition without realizing that that's going to be defined already. I'm sure it happens, but it also doesn't happen massively often. I mean, it's not a problem. Actually, what I'm thinking yeah. is that this could be used to detect definitions that are okay. relevant to other people. Oh, okay. what, is much more, what is much more probable is that you could detect uh, little snippets of proofs that happen over and over again, but they were not extracted into a definition. So very mm -hmm. often the user will make some moves over and over again that is like make this step, make this step, and then again make the same step, make two steps again. <laughs> but they're not going to say or notice explicitly that this is what we're going to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and maybe yeah. you don't want it. No, actually, so sometimes you don't want to make a lemma for this because applying the lemma brings in its own bag of problems. So you, for example, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. Right, for instance, so so so, so you might be saying, oh, I have two nested, I very often I have two nested lambdas. I have oh, okay. function mapping x2, function mapping y2. Okay, and this is very often. You're not going to make a lemma about that because you no, right? There's no way to make a lemma about that. You'll say apply the lemma and you will again have the exact same problem and you will make a function of two arguments. Mm. But, but that's what I can't do with it. Yeah. Uh -huh, if you, so basically, you're saying if you introduce a lemma, you get some syntactic super every time you apply it. Or, or, or... I don't know. It's a good question to ask why do people make certain things into <laughs> definitions? So, certainly, yeah. some, of the, some of them are ends in themselves, right? Mm -hmm. I proved. Some theorem with the name, and yeah. now I'm proud of myself, <laughs> and that's a golden set. Or if you always combine uh, certain definitions in a certain way. So yeah. that's the other use, right? You notice a common pattern and extract yeah. it into a lemma, yeah. but you don't consider it. So this is precisely where people say lemma versus theorem, right? Mm -hmm. So in yeah. the paper, they say theorem when it's a result, and it's a lemma when they think, oh, this is just something it's stupid. Just on the way. Need. Yes. And then, of course, they. They miss the point, and then that's why we have very famous theorems of the problemas. Yes. <laughs> sure. Good. Okay. The last question. The last question. Well, uh, the weather is better, right? Uh, yeah. So we are free to go wherever we want. But let's not walk to Shishka, though. Uh, no. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I mean, I'm inclined to repeat Hombre. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Is that okay? That's okay. Yeah. yeah. I know it's a boring answer. But okay. Yeah. <laughs> so we shall meet soonish. Let's say twenty past. Twenty past yeah. in. in let's not be late. Okay. So eighteen past so that it really is. Go up now. And yeah. 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 So <laughs>